Hello again. Uh, uh, we were we are going to to see again this this paper that I was presenting last week. Uh, so maybe to summarize summarize what what uh, we are trying to do is uh, we want to sample from a log concave uh, distribution that is pi proportional to e to the minus f, f we are going to call it uh, our potential. Uh, we are interested in doing this, but instead we are going to make a discretization uh, through the Langevin Monte Carlo algorithm. Uh, this algorithm has its own stationary measure, that is pi eta. So we are going to prove some bound, some concentration bounds for these for for this distribution pi eta, not pi pi. Uh, so well, I already uh, told you about this, but uh, yeah, uh, we know that when the potential f is a smooth and strongly convex, then the, the potential the distribution pi satisfy logarithmic solid inequality. Uh, when it's only smooth, satisfies Poincare inequality. And well, the same questions uh, can be posed for pi e. Uh, in a paper by Willy Sonna and Belfada, a recent version, uh, they prove that well, if you have a smoothness and a strong convexity for the potential f, then pi eta also satisfies logarithmic solid inequality. So this is not a question mark. This is logarithmic solid inequality. The other question I think that it is not addressed in the paper. So I think that it is open. Remains open. Uh, well, the, the same thing happens here about concentration. Uh, the, since we know that. Um, we have logarithmic subordinate inequality for pi when the, the potential is smooth and strongly convex. Uh, we know that it satisfies sub Gaussian concentration. And we also know that if only the potential is only smooth, then uh, pi satisfies a sub exponential concentration. So, what we are uh, going to address in this presentation is. Um, the concentration for this other mesh, uh, distribution, pi eta. So in this presentation, we are going to see that uh, pi eta, under the same, uh, the same assumptions that the potential is smooth and strongly convex, we, we are going to have that pi eta it, it satisfies a sub-Gaussian concentration. And if, if the potential is only smooth, then it satisfies a, a, a sub-exponential concentration. Uh, so again, we are going to uh, repeat what are what we are assuming about the potential. We assume that the potential is convex. We always assume that the potential is convex. Uh, we assume that it is m smooth. That uh, translates to the the Lipschitzness of its gradient. Uh, we always assume that it has a minimizer. Uh, by a shifting, we always we always can assume that the minimizer is the vector zero, and we assume that uh, the the function is not constant. There is a radius uh, such that if we are uh, at this count, at least r from the minimizer, then we are greater, strictly greater than the function on the minimum. Uh, well, sometimes we assume that f is also m, a little m, strongly convex. That means this inequality uh, OK. So again, the way that we want to prove this, this uh, at least the sub-Gaussian concentration, is through a bound uh, of the moment generating. Uh, we, uh, <laughs> I am not going to repeat that. Um, in fact, I want to go to the maybe go to the DLM directly. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's so, um, yeah. 
Here we are going to prove uh, this theorem that uh, for strongly convex potentials and also M smooth potential, but, uh, strongly convex and M smooth potential, we have a sub Gaussian concentration for the pi eta distribution, the distribution of the pi eta. Um, yeah. So um, I want to read this. We're going to, if you uh, suppose that f is a m strongly convex function that is m smooth, uh, that we are running a Langer in Monte Carlo with this step size. And then we are going to have that this concentration bound, where this constant c that appears here is a contraction constant. It is always um, less than a one, at least in the strongly convex case. For the smooth case, this constant is one. Mm. So yeah, uh, we are going to try to prove this here. Uh, I don't know if there is any question. I I went ultra fast. Yeah. Uh, no, but this is a summary of last time anyway. Okay. Uh, so, um, yeah. So let's go. Let, let's uh, introduce the 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 objects that we need to prove this theorem. Uh, we are going to define this big pi function that in the paper they call the diagonal function. Uh, so this, this big pi function is defined for all d, all dimensions, and all weights lambda strictly greater than zero. And it, it is defined through this expected value of this exponential. Here we have that uh, um, d is uniform on the sphere. The, uh, the, this is this always uh, will denote that we have a distribution, the uniform, uniform distribution over the sphere. Um, and in fact, you can see that uh, this looks like uh, a common degradation function. It's a kind of, kind of. Uh, so we, the idea is that we are going to to bound this function. Take, take, uh, then take expectations and then uh, deduce the, the bounds and the concentration bound. Like uh, Chernoff type uh, 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 um, Okay, so we have some properties for this Lyapunov function. Uh, first is that, is that this Lyapunov function is invariant under rotations. And that is because it is defined uh, through this uniform distribution over the sphere. So if we have uh, we have we have a rotation here on acting on x, then well this rotation is going to pass uh, through the the transpose to the other side, and we also going to have a, a uniform distribution uh, by this rotation times the uniform vector on the sphere. So there is no problem with that. Uh, and in fact, that that implies that this big phi function can be written as a little phi function that only depends on x through its norm. Through its, its norm. Uh, and yeah, I, I'm going to write these properties. Um, so the Lyapunov function. can be written in this way. And this little phi function, well, by this, this invariance under rotations, uh, can, uh, it is written in this way. And uh, we only use the first canonical uh, vector. So here, little phi uh, of C where C is a real number, is equal to uh, the expected value. Okay. I did 
wrong place. <laughs> the, 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 second, the second property uh, says that, uh, in fact, we can, in, instead of writing this expected value, taking uh, the uniform distribution over the sphere, we can, we can take the uniform distribution over the rotations. So this is the second property. That expression, expected value uh, with respect to the uniform distribution over the sphere. And this is equal to this other This is true for all u in on the unit sphere. Uh, third property, uh, well, this is not important for the proof, uh, but this little phi function can always be written in this way, where this is the gamma function and this is the Bessel function. And the alpha that appears here uh, depends on the, di in the dimension. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> but I'm wondering if this last expression is not defined with this one thing equal to zero, but the first one is fairly well defined. Uh, ah. Yeah. What is the problem? Are we allowed to take ah, z no, equals no, zero? You don't have a problem because you have the Bessel function. Yeah. The multiplication ah. allows to, to arrive to the, the, the limit to be one. Yeah. Ah. So. And also, uh, we are taking always, uh, ah. yeah, we are taking always a lambda greater than zero. Uh, uh, no. Oh, uh, yeah, I think. I guess so. Yeah. I, yeah. The, uh, there is no problem with the definition. I think that uh, you can always. Uh, Take the limit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 I know. I know how this particular vessel function looks uh, like, but yeah. Yeah, I, I think that for, for the proof, it, it's not really important how it looks. Mm -hmm. like. It has a property that it is relevant for the pseudo exponential concentration. Um, so I am not going to write that, but I'm going to write this. Uh, that it says that. This Yabunov function behaves well under Gaussian convolution. So, also have that this little phi function is always positive and increasing on well the the positive axis of the reals. I think that in fact it is strictly increasing. So it's positive. And the 
last property is that, well, this little phi function after after some time, after uh, if you if you take an R uh, sufficiently large, uh, this little phi function has an exponential growth. Mm -hmm. And that property is used in the sub-exponential concentration. And, and in fact, <laughs> the, the constant that appears here it depends on D. And I don't know if you remember from the from the last session, but the sub-exponential concentration has some some appears some constants, and it, and they are not very well quantified. In fact, uh, that one of the constants depends on this, and this is here, here at least is not quantified. So, yeah. Uh, I'm not I'm I'm not going to write that for the moment. I'm going to focus on the theorem. Yeah. So we're going to prove this theorem. Um, yeah. Uh, in order to do this, we need to uh, establish a lemma that says that um, the the gradient descent actualization when you have a, a strongly convex potential, is contracted. So, yeah, uh, yeah, but it's, it's a clear. So, you have this bound here that depends on C, that is the contraction constant, that is always less than one. Well, in this case, we are allowing to a uh, little m to be zero, so can be less or equal than one. But in the case of the, in the setting of the theorem, we are thinking m, little m, to be strictly greater than c. So yeah. here c is strictly less than one. And we are going to think uh, by a shifting, if you want, that the minimizer of the function is the vector zero, so we can omit this term from here. So we always, we always have that. You only need this property with respect to x star? That's enough for the proof? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, we need the, this contractivity. Uh, we, uh, I am going to put the, the theorem here. So, let's prove this. Um, so, what the idea is the following um, we want to bound. Um, The Landry and Monte Carlo uh, actualization is written in this way. We have the, the actualization that we are going to call x2 prime. It's written as a gradient descent step that we are going to call x prime plus uh, some Gaussian noise. So. What uh, we are going to do, uh, at, le at least in the first part of this proof, is to bound the Lyapunov function evaluated on x2 prime, that is this actualization, in terms of some constant, and the Lyapunov function on x. This came from here. So. Uh, and in fact, with, uh, with uh, to the power of c, where c is this contraction. So if we have this, then we are going to take um, uh, expected value uh, with respect to the stationary distribution, uh, because uh, since the um, since it is the stationary distribution, if this x has this distribution, then this x2 prime also will have this stationary distribution. Mm -hmm. So that, that is the, the idea. We are going to prove that. OK. So the first thing is that, well, x2 prime can be written in this way. Yeah. Can be written in this way. Uh, we have a way to control this Gaussian noise. 
by the uh, fourth property. So in expectation, in expectation, we have that this is equal to, uh, well, uh, e to the power lambda squared times the variance over two uh, times the Lyapunov function of x prime. And this variance is equal to two lambda the, by the definition of the Langevin Monte Carlo algorithm. So this is, in the end, this is. Um, Uh, it's a square. I think that two lambda square is a square. Um, yeah, that, that, that is. Uh, is square. It's not. Ah, no. There is a problem. Uh, yeah. Sigma square is equal to two lambda. Uh, so. Sigma square is two lambda, so we replace this by two lambda. And we have two lambda over two, so this is only lambda. Lambda squared eta? Uh, yes. No, because we have that the variance is equal to two eta. Ah, okay. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So now we have this, this relation here. We are going to try to bound this, this other expression. The Lyapunov function on x prime. So, um, okay. Uh, the Lyapunov function on x prime, well, can be written as the little pi function. So, lambda times the norm of x prime. But x prime is the gradient descent optimization. Okay, uh, we have that this gradient descent optimization is uh, contracted, so this expression from here can be bounded by this lemma by c times x. Uh, we, ha we also have that this little pi function, uh, this little pi function is uh, increasing, so we can bound, upper bound this. This is uh, little pi of c times the norm of x. Okay. Um, what happened to lambda? Uh, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Lambda C times lambda. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. We have that this little pi function can be written. Uh, in fact, by definition, is this expected value from here. So this uh, term C that is there appears here uh, in the in the power of E. So, um, well, C is between, in between 0 and 1, so x to the power of C is a concave function, mm -hmm. and we can use uh, Jensen inequality to balance. Mm. So, we can bound this by Jensen inequality. Well, uh, by um, practically by definition, this expression from here is the Lyapunov function that was the big five. So this can this is equal to the big pi of the lambda of x x to the power of c. 
Ja. Um. So, we have that uh, expected value of x2 prime, we have no function of x2 prime, is less or equal than e to the power of lambda squared theta uh, times the Lyapunov function e lambda x to the power of c. Um, yeah. So what we are going to do now is to um, take expectation with, the, with the using that x follows this stationary distribution. So um, by the, station, the stationarity of the distribution, we have that x2 prime, that is the Angeli Monte Carlo uh, atomization, also uh, has this distribution. So we have this. Um, and And we can also use Jensen's inequality again to down this by C. Mm. Yeah. So now we can reorder these terms to have a bound for the uh, expected value of the Lyapunov function. Um, I'm going to erase this. Mm. There is no problem if I erase this. So we have, if we reorder this, we have that the expected value of the Lyapunov function is less or equal than e to the power of lambda squared theta uh, over one minus c. And well, we can uh, write the definition of the Lyapunov function, that is this expected value uh, with respect to the uniform distribution on the sphere. Mm -hmm. But instead, instead we are going to use this other property that instead of taking the expected value with respect to the uniform, the, uh, the uniform distribution on the sphere, we are going to take the, the uniform distribution of over the rotations. Mm -hmm. So we are going to write that. Um, yeah. um, of e to the lambda u uh, r x this is a random vector um, yeah. this is bounded by this expression yeah so this is almost a uh, uh, a bound for a moment generating function. Uh, what we can try to do is define a new random vector y equal to. Can you write a little bit to the? I I uh, don't see yeah. what you're writing. <laughs> we can define a new vector y mm. equal to r x. Mm. 
this is our new random vector. Um, and well, since this y is a rotation of x, uh, y and x uh, has have the same norm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what, uh, well, this y has a distribution pi e a tilde, and we can, well, the expectation over this, this distribution is going to be this by, by three. So, mm -hmm. we have that, and the expectation of y with respect to this pi eta tilde distribution uh, of e to the power of lambda u uh, r x. Why? Well, as, as I said uh, recently, uh, this expectation is the same that this expectation over here. So we can bound this by this expression up here. And this is a moment generating, a bound for the moment generating for y. So from here, we can uh, deduce a uh, sub Gaussian concentration for y. Hmm. And yeah. So expression, the expression is. concentration bound for y that the norm of y the probability that the norm of y is greater or equal than um, 4 times the square root of eta over 1 minus c uh, of square root of 2d plus the square root of log 1 over delta Uh, yeah. is less than delta. Um, yeah, so since this y, this y random vector is a rotation of x, a random rotation of x, this y and x has, they have the, the same norm, so they have the same, the same uh, concentration. So, yeah, the this is the expression of the theorem that mm. is not longer in the, the reaction. But yeah, to uh, so yeah, this is exactly the, the expression for for the theorem. And to go from here to there, we only need to use that the the norm of y is equal to the norm. Uh, I'm not, not going to write that. It's only like you. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, um, uh, there is any question about the, the proof? I so I think we used that, uh, what is the previous answer we used here? That if you have a, uh, the moment generating function satisfies the quality, yeah. Yeah. then you have a sub Gaussian. Yeah, for a while. Right, right. What that, that, that result, you have this result before, right? What? Um, the slides or... Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I just want to see what the user is Yeah, I see that this same idea, yeah. Okay. So, the idea is to prove a bound for a moment generating function. What moment generating function, or which moment generating function uh, it is clear in the proof is for y, not for x. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's a kind of the trick of the new proof. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's good. Yeah. I think that he is a pretty smart <laughs> mm. uh, way to 
please. I do not have time to see. It's so, so the claim is that the, this probability over pi eta tilde of the norm of y is exactly the same probability as of pi of eta over norm of x? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I guess that they have, they should have the same law because of that equality. I, it makes sense to yeah. me. I, I didn't prove it that way. I think that mm -hmm. it makes sense. Um, yeah. 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 Okay. Is, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think that I don't have time to put the other concentration down, but uh, I don't know. I, I think um, the impression that it gave me that this proof is that it is not as smart that as this this or subgauss. I think that the the techniques was the, the technique was developed for the subgaussian and then used for the, the adapted. The, the the objects to prove this other and yeah yeah I, I mean it is quite messy so I think that I'm not going to prove it. But um, can can you say is 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 actually just trying to use the same technique like a brute force or? <laughs> uh, I mean, is there new ingredients or like? I, I guess you have these other properties you haven't even used yeah. yet, right? Uh, I, uh, yeah, they need to use them. What property that I didn't use? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the I, and they need to use this uh, exponential growth for this little phi function. Mm -hmm. um, and they also need. To, yeah, there is another lemma that they need to use that if you have a log concave probability distribution, we, have, we are thinking here pi as a density function, mm -hmm. you, you have that this uh, pi is always sub-exponential. It must be sub-exponential. Concave implies sub-exponential. Yeah, so uh, the potential that defines this pi uh, must uh, be uh, super linear. They need to use that. Mm -hmm. And that if you have a convex super linear the objective function, the gradient descent always makes this this progress. That's just because f is bounded by below by a linear function. That's all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And but I mean, again, I have here's another constant that depends on f, but is not quantified. So uh, I see. They 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 use this. The, the constant that appears in the theorem depends on, on this, on the constant for the super lean, for the exponential growth of the little phi, mm -hmm. and this constant from the, mm -hmm. the um, so <laughs> uh, sufficiently, uh, sufficient uh, progress for mm -hmm. the super linear function. So this, this second lemma you showed is, is, mm -hmm. is interesting, right? It, it says that, I guess, it's far this enough? No, uh, it's this one. Yeah, if far you enough, you're contracting with your iterates. Uh, it's not a multiplicative contraction; it's just like an additive one. Yeah. Um, but then, th then I guess it's, this is just far away enough, right? It's not cannot be true everywhere. Yeah. Okay. Huh. Uh, yeah, mm. yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think that. Uh, yeah. yeah. This other yes. proof is <laughs> <laughs> too messy. Nice. The result is true for m small convex function, but that enjoy this super linear growth condition. Yeah, that's it, enough. Yeah, yeah, that is. is yeah. They uh, think that they not do not prove this. Yeah. Okay. They do not but prove this. But there's a, an extra assumption. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not yeah. just. Yeah. But yeah. They yeah they need to use this. Uh, I mean. Yeah, it's for because uh, they using they are using this this other property, and, and yeah, I, I saw the the book that they make reference here, and in that book they in the proof of this lemma, I think that they also do not quantify this constant from here. So, which book is that one? Oh, um, I think that uh, I need to. Write okay. It. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, it was a, a big book. <laughs> okay. No, I mean, my, my question was, because um, there's there's always this assumption, of course, if you need to do this log concave sampling, e to the minus f should be at least in L1, but I'm, I'm guessing like L2 or something, right? 
And it's never been clear to me what kind of growth conditions a nephew would need. Certainly there's, there's sufficient conditions, but I, I, I don't know if there's this well-established like, mm. uh, that for integrability of e to the minus f, you need that f grows like something. Mm. Uh, I mean, this is one of the conditions. And this, is, uh, this seems to hint upon that, right? Yeah, like and this, is net, this is necessary. Uh, I think that a sufficient one is that you have a minimizer for the function. And okay. you have, uh, oh, it is not constant. Uh, I, mean, I mean, no, it's not. Yeah, it is not constant. Yeah, I guess, ah, I, now I'm thinking, maybe it relates to the fact of having a global minimum and then some kind of, uh, Ah, uh, support function, like you can build a support function around this thing, like that should control somehow the integrability, I'm yeah. guessing. Okay, mm. okay. That, that would be nice to know. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty yeah. interesting uh, when this, this is true. Yeah. yeah. Mm. This condition for even in this strongly convex case, no, you know, but it's really it's convex is always integrable, right? Yeah, yeah. No, 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 but yeah. I have a, a different question maybe for you. you a, a strongly convex function, in other words, when you have contractivity with, the, with respect to the minimizer, that's it's equivalent to have strict, convex, strict convexity? Because it, it seems a little bit more general, no? Yeah, I don't think so. No. I, I, like having contractivity with respect to the minimizer. Because the, the, no. the operators like that are known. Like they call it pseudo contractivity. Yeah, yeah, they give X to one it, minus right. X star, smaller than a constant. Yeah. Smaller than one times the norm of X minus X star. Right. Which, which is less than having contractivity all over the place. Yeah. Mm. But it seems that they need only this condition in that point. Yeah. And the yeah. question is there is there are some convex functions that are not strongly convex. That's right. I, that have this property or not. I don't know by heart, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that these, these two classes are different. Like if you're having contraction with respect to the solution, yeah. that's that's basically what you need for these like uh, phager monotone yeah, sequences and blah, blah, absolutely. blah. Absolutely, it's, right? it's a well-known thing. But, but, but for instance, if, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure that, for instance, if, if, if your norm is not Euclidean, no, it's, it's not the same. Mm -hmm. Because it's very hard, I, I mean, it's very hard to prove contraction for norms which are not the two norms, right? They're not, not Euclidean norms. Yeah. Yet, you would have this contraction around the optimum always, right? right. So, I, I, I think not, but I, I, I don't have a reference. Because it is interesting the way that they put this result, you know? So if you have this condition, yeah. In the whole space, and then we were using it only on this point to have this, this very nice trick. You know? Well, but what I did present required uh, contraction property yeah. everywhere, right? That's so the mixing for, times. For the mixing time, I, I, I agree, yeah, because I read that. But paper. for concentration? Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Cool. So next time, uh, Max is going to present. Uh, yeah, I guess there's not enough time for, <laughs> for you today. <laughs> But yeah, thanks Juan Pablo again. Uh.